Right, we'll just wait for everyone to come in. Oh, and they're flooding in. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the FASD Hubs webinar. Um, delighted to have everyone. We're gonna, we're gonna go through how everything works in a minute. So don't worry um, how, if you've not been to one of these before, but great to see you. And is anyone else really cold? Okay, who's got the heating on? No, no. Okay, I'm going to get those that have come into the room just while we're waiting for everyone to join. If you wouldn't mind just popping in chat if you are a prospective adopter, an adopter, a social worker, um, a young person thinking about adoption, that would just give us a really great idea of um, who our audience is. So just while we're waiting for everyone to come in. So thank you very much. So we'll see where everyone is. That's all you have to do tonight. It's okay. It's not too much work. I promise. So let's see. So who have we got? So do we have any prospective adopters here? You might just want to put yes, a prospective adopter, thank you, in the adoption process. Prospective adopter, prospective adopter, thank you. Yeah, thumbs up. Prospective adopters, brilliant. Um, and do we have any adopters with children placed? See so if we get any thumbs up in the adoption process about to start stage one. <laughs> Exciting. I always get goosebumps when that happens. Prospective adopters, that's prospective adopters. Lovely. Any social workers? Because you, you can put your hand up to be a social worker. We love social workers, it's not a problem. Prospective adopter, prospective adopter. Okay. So I think we've got all prospective adopters tonight. So thank you very much. We've got lots to fit in. So shall we make a start? Is that okay, panel? Yeah. Um, so, okay, if you haven't joined a webinar before, welcome. These are set up as webinars, so we can't see you and we can't hear you. So you can be sitting in your pajamas and that's absolutely fine. I may confess to doing pajama bottoms, but shh, don't tell anyone. Um, so we can interact through the chat as you've been doing, so thank you very much for that. And we've also got at the bottom question and answers. Now this is being recorded, but when we do questions, we won't call out anybody's name. So we will say a question has been asked about. So everything's kept confidential because this does go on the YouTube channel. So just wanted you know, feel free to ask any questions. It's a very safe space. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing everybody. So Barbara, can I start with you and then we can go round. Would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm Barbara. I'm FESD Project Lead at FESD Hub Scotland. So I manage the project and I'm an adoptive parent of two young people. I have a 15 year old and a 14 year old and both have a history of prenatal alcohol exposure. And my 14 year old has a diagnosis of FESD. And we adopted him when he was 13 months old and he'd already been diagnosed at that point. So we knowingly, knowingly adopted a child with FBSD, which usually puts me in the minority, but actually there's more than one of us here tonight. <laughs> so, Terry. And, uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Terry, should we go leading to you? Because I think that leads on, doesn't it? Hi there. Um, I'm Terry. I, I'm a I'm adoptive mum to an 11 year old boy. Um, he came to us when he was three and a half years old, and he already had the diagnosis of FASD. He had gotten that at 15 months old whilst he was in a foster care placement. Um, he has a lot of sensory issues, um, as well as the FASD diagnosis. Um, he also has a lot of anxiety. Um, it's further complicated for him because he actually has um, a, another physical disability as well, um, which means he has um, no immune system, um, really. Um, but um, yeah, we don't have any other birth children. He's been with us eight years now. And um, yeah, he's a bit of a live wire. <laughs> That's Thank you very much. We shall find out more as the evening progresses. Thanks, Terry. Anya, do you want to do an introduction? To you. Yeah, I'm I'm Anya, um, and I am a mum of three, um, two birth children, one adopted um, little man. Uh, he came to us at 15 months and um, had a diagnosis around uh, three or four years old, so quite early on. Um, and uh, yeah, amazing young man, but there's been many challenges along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here this evening. And Caroline. Hi everyone, I'm Caroline. I am birth mum to three children and adoptive mum to a 10 year old girl who's really been with us from birth onwards. Um, she has been noted as being at risk for 
FASD, um, we've still got some more assessments to go through, which could probably take quite a while, but we're ready for that journey. Um, she is, she is, she keeps us on our toes. Never, it's never boring, which is, which can be a good thing. Um, but she's absolutely wonderful and we wouldn't just, we wouldn't change her for the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's lovely that you're all here this evening and giving up your time. So thank you very much for that. Um, my name is Claire Tyler and I'm the Community and Support Manager for um, Adoption UK. I'm an adoptive mum. I adopted my son when he was seven and he's now just turned 19. We got an FASD diagnosis um, when he was about 11 and a half. So that's my experience. So this evening we're going to start with a presentation from Barbara. Um, so he's going to go through the main facts and information about FASD. Then we're going to open up to questions. So any questions that you think while Barbara's doing her presentation, please drop them down, put them in the chat, put them in the question and answers, and we can just do that flowing as we go through the evening. So thank you very much. Over to Barbara. Here we go. Right. Uh, that should be me unmuted. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm just sorting my screen out here. Here we go. So I'm going to spend a wee bit of time just going through FASD basics for you, really. And we're going to start off with what is FASD, which is, seems like a logical place to start. So FASD stands for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. It is the result of an alcohol-exposed pregnancy that affects the developing brain and body of an individual before they were born. FASD is a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition and often referred to as a hidden disability. FASD is a spectrum and each person with FASD is affected differently. Each person with FASD has both strengths and challenges. They and their families need support to learn FASD informed strategies to help them prosper. When an early diagnosis is made, the right supports are put in place in education at home and in the workplace, then individuals are more likely to succeed and achieve throughout life. Just spotted another typo in that. <laughs> um, so that's really kind of FASD in a nutshell. It's a lifelong condition. The only way to have FASD is if you're part of an alcohol exposed pregnancy. Individuals with FASD have many challenges, but they also have many strengths and they can achieve amazing things. So prenatal alcohol exposure is what leads to FASD and alcohol is a teratogen or a poison. And this is a, a teratogen is a substance that can cross the placenta and can cause damage to brain cells and the central nervous system. And because alcohol is water soluble, when a pregnancy is alcohol exposed, it passes freely through the placenta into the fetal blood supply or even before the placenta is in place, then when the cells are developing, then harm can be caused then as well. It's the most common, no, well, it's the most known common cause of neurodevelopmental disability and birth defect. We say in the Western world, because that's what the research covers, but in reality, it is the, the most common neurodevelopmental disability in the world. And it's also lifelong, there is no cure. It's thought to affect around three to five percent of the population. So that's around about kind of one in 20. And I'll go on to say more about that in a moment. But it is much, much more common than, for example, autism, autism spectrum disorder. FASD affects about one in 20 and ASD affects about one in 96. So it is very, very common indeed. However, it's one of these conditions, if you ask somebody in the street corner to tell you something about autism, then they probably could. Ask someone in the street corner to tell you about FASD and the first thing they would say would be, what's that? So there's a, a very clear message throughout the whole of the UK from all the chief medical officers and through all the governments. And that is that there's no known safe amount of alcohol in pregnancy or any known safe period of pregnancy in which the pregnancy can become alcohol exposed. So it's a very clear message of no alcohol, no risk. And as I'll share with you in a few minutes, no two individuals on the spectrum are the same. And it's common to have what's known as a spiky profile. I'll come back to that in a few moments. 
FASD is a whole body condition. It can affect any part of the body or brain. So it could be the brain structure, brain functioning. It could be muscle tone. It could be even how curly the toenails are. There's something about children with FASD, their, their toenails. I, my, my son is 14 and I've never cut his toenails in his entire life. So there's, there's just little things like that. There's about 428 comorbidities associated with FASD. It can affect any part of the body. It's very much a whole body condition. FASD is an invisible disability. If you know anything about FASD, it may be that there are some facial features associated with the condition. And these are a thin upper lip, a smooth philtrum, which is a little groove between your nose and your lip, and narrow eye openings. However, only about 10% of individuals with FASD have these facial features. So you cannot tell by looking at somebody if they have the condition at all. And the reason that so few people have the facial features is because there's a very narrow window of pregnancy and where the facial features are affected by the alcohol. So uh, that's why 90% of individuals do not have any facial features. But we know that with the right uh, with the early diagnosis and the right support and intervention, then individuals with FASD can thrive and can be successful. They can work, they can live independently. If you think about one in 20 people in the UK have FASD, then there's a lot of people with FASD out there who don't even know they have the condition, who are functioning and doing really well. Now, I mentioned the prevalence rate of about three to five percent. Now, that's within the general population. And while FASD may affect anyone who is exposed to alcohol and ritual, some groups are disproportionately affected. And one of these are children and young people who have been taken into care, where there is a higher likelihood of prenatal alcohol exposure. So there's some research that took place in Peterborough in 2015, and that revealed that 75 percent of children put forward for adoption medical had prenatal alcohol exposure noted on their medical records. Now that doesn't mean that 75% of children went on to have FASD. It means that 75% of the pregnancies were alcohol exposed. We also know that care experienced children and young people could be four times as likely to have FASD as the general population and that 34% of looked after children, so foster care and kinship care, had a history of prenatal alcohol exposure. So as you can tell, FASD does become a significant part of the picture for many adoptive and kinship and fostering families. And that's something very much that people are becoming more aware of. And that's why Adoption UK are putting so much work and support into uh, helping people such as yourselves understand a bit more about the condition. So as I mentioned earlier, alcohol is a teratogen, which is a substance that can cross the placenta and cause damage to the brain cells or the central nervous system. And I think this is quite a, a fact that a lot of people are kind of taken back by, and that is that of all the substances of abuse, including cocaine, heroin, heroin and marijuana, it's alcohol that produces by far the most serious neurobehavioural effects in the fetus. So you might have heard about babies who have been born maybe addicted to drugs. Now they might have a very, very difficult start in life, months or year in life, very difficult indeed. However, long term, looking across the lifespan, it's actually alcohol which is more harmful. And um, well, I'll give you some more examples in a few moments of how that might look across the lifespan. I won't go into too much detail on this slide, but it's just to say that um, if the brain is asked to carry out a command, maybe store a piece of information, then a neurotypical brain, which is somebody who does not have a neurodevelopmental condition, then their brain would be able to, to carry out that instruction very quickly and very easily. Now, someone who is neurodivergent, for example, somebody who has FASD, they can still achieve and they can still do really well and they can still complete the task. But sometimes the journey to completing that task is a little bit different. 
It maybe takes people a wee bit longer to do something. They maybe need to have a rest on the way. They maybe have to go over and over the same way again, maybe relearn things, but they do get there in the end with the right support. They're the same destination, but their brain just takes a different route because their brain is wired differently. And that's something that's hard to see because obviously we can't see somebody's brain, but we can get to know people really well and the people that we're caring for, and we can find ways to support them. And looking briefly at some of the, the common challenges for people with FESD, attention and memory, particularly memory, can be quite difficult, working memory and remembering pieces of information, like short term pieces of information. Hyperactivity, a lot, the majority of people with FESD can also have an uh, ADHD diagnosis. The two go very closely hand in hand. There's a big overlap between the conditions. Cognitive fatigue is about exhaustion from trying to sit still in the classroom or um, trying not to be overwhelmed with what's going on around about you. They may have challenges with communication. That might be receptive communication or expressive communication. So understanding what's being said or trying to explain what they know can be difficult. They might struggle with abstract concepts such as telling the time or using money. Social skills is a really big one. I would say that a lot of the, the challenges around social skills kind of really begin to come out between the ages of about eight and 12. And they might act much younger than their age. They might prefer to play with younger children. They might become quite vulnerable as well. Might struggle with planning and problem solving skills. It's executive functioning skills because they take place in the frontal lobe of the brain, which is the last bit of the brain to develop. So can problem solving, planning, routines, changes to routine can be quite difficult and quite stressful for some individuals. Might struggle to learn from consequences, which can be quite frustrating, but it's, again, it's to do with memory and it's to do with executive functioning skills. Might have poor judgment skills, using the information around about them to make wise decisions. They may have poor impulse control, so they might lash out or they might eat too much or they kind of carry it. It's action and then the thinking comes later. Might struggle with auditory processing, which is what you're all doing just now. Listening to me and you're all probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed with all this information that you're hearing as your brain is trying to process it all. That's very much how individuals with FESD feel as well. There may be sleeping and eating issues. Sleeping can be a big issue. Uh, to do with maybe they don't know they maybe haven't developed an internal body clock or they maybe struggle with time and and so sleeping is a big is a big issue but there is a lot of support available with that emotional regulation is about knowing what emotion to use in certain situations they may become overwhelmed or dysregulated by what's going on around them motor skills and mobility maybe poor muscle tone in the legs uh, maybe fine motor skills but on the other hand this could be a real strength because a lot of people with FESD are fantastic sports people so that, that, that's one that can definitely go both ways and a lot of individuals have difficulty with sensory processing as well so they might be hypersensitive where they get maybe quite dysregulated if there's a lot of noise and light and sound and smells around about them or they might be um, hyposensitive where they may be more sensory seekers or they maybe don't feel pain um, and it's, um, it's all kind of kind of numbed down their senses and this is what I, I mentioned a wee bit earlier on this is what we call the the spiky profile of FASD and all those things that I've just mentioned you wouldn't have one individual who had all of those challenges Everybody is very much an individual and we need to get to know what everybody's strengths are and what everybody's challenges are. But imagine you had an 18 year old. They might have the expressive language skills of a 20 year old. So that's really good. You can hold a really good conversation with them. But they might have the reading ability of a 16 year old. But that's OK. You can get by with the reading ability of a 16 year old. The living skills might be at age 11. 
you begin to think, oh, that could be a problem. Money and time concepts could be at age eight. Social skills might be down at age seven. Comprehension and social maturity could be at age six. So it's impossible to say what, um, you we would always say that you've got to think about stage of development and not age of development because an individual with FPSD has a spiky profile and different parts of their development will be at different levels. And this can even change on like a day-to-day -day or even hour by hour basis, depending how tired they're feeling. Uh, but if we get to know our individuals really, really well, then we can offer support and, and know where they're, where they're actually functioning at. As individuals grow up, then particularly the kind of later teens going into early childhood, there are some associated difficulties with the condition. And this was some, some research that told us that individuals with FESD may experience social difficulties in relating to peers. They may have poor mental health. They may have alcohol or drug misuse issues, involvement with law enforcement, inappropriate sexual behaviours, difficulty with employability and independent living. And they may become a vulnerable adult themselves. But all of these things are absolutely <laughs> um, not definitely going to happen. They're not, we have no idea how an individual is going to, to achieve and what their strengths are going to be. We know that with the right support, individuals with FBSD can lead happy and successful lives. But FBSD also coexists alongside a lot of other conditions as well. There's a lot of overlap. So it's quite common for an individual to have a diagnosis of FBSD and autism, or FBSD and ADHD, or FBSD and sensory processing disorder. So it's um, FBSD would always be the primary diagnosis because that's the kind of one that came first when the brain was developing. Uh, but it is quite common that other diagnoses are given alongside FASD. Now I've said an awful lot of challenging stuff there for you and I'm sure some of that was really quite hard to hear and we are going to be spending really the rest of the evening telling you some of the challenges but also about how wonderful our children are but these are some of the the really lovely characteristics uh, and strengths of our children and young people. They can be really likeable really friendly. I say that as uh, my son would get a piece at any door, as they say in Scotland. He uh, is just a charmer. He, I don't know what it is, but elderly ladies over the age of 70, he just bats his eyelids at them and they all fall in love. <laughs> he's, he's been a flirt since he was one. He's just, uh, our children are so lovable and friendly and affectionate and want to be friends with people and uh, they can have amazing talents as well, music and and art and athletics. So although I've said a lot of challenging stuff there, it's really important we don't lose, lose sight of just how amazing and successful our children and young people can be. Just gonna spend a couple of minutes just telling you a little bit about FESD Hub Scotland. And I know that as prospective adopters, you're not at this stage yet, but I just want to make you aware that FESD Hub Scotland, although we offer a lot of support in Scotland, if you, are looking for any advice, if you are thinking about adopting a child with a history of prenatal alcohol exposure, then we'd be happy to have a talk to you. We have a, a big online community for parents and carers, Facebook group and regular virtual meetups. We have lots of training courses that are available to everybody as well. And we've got a helpline, which you're, you're welcome to give us a call if you've got any questions. But I won't go through that slide, but that's just some of the things that we can do to support families. And I'd also like to just draw your attention to a fact sheet that we've written specifically for you, for prospective adopters and foster carers. You'll find this on, on our website, but I'll try to put the link in the chat when I finish speaking so you can find it. And this just gives you some basic information about FESD, but it also gives you some ideas about what you should be looking for when you're looking to be matched with a child, what kind of questions you should be asking social workers, particularly around getting evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure. So I would definitely recommend that you have a look at that and have a look at our website. You'll find lots more information on fesdhub.scot. Now I'm going to finish talking, but before that, I'm going to just show you a little video because I know I've given you a lot of really difficult information there. 
but uh, we have a song out at the moment. We have a single. It didn't quite reach number one. I'm still trying to get over that, but we are very excited about it. It's uh, a charity single that has been released by Adoption UK and by FESC Hub Scotland. And it is it features Darren Day, and who's at a West End star, and a choir of children with FESD and other neurodevelopmental conditions. And the, the single at the moment has just been released, but we're also asking people to add their voices and then we're going to re-release it. It's all building towards a big event in March in Wembley. So I'd like to play the song to you because I, I think you'll find it uplifting and it'll just, I, I really hope it kind of reminds you of just how fantastic our children are and how they can achieve. I'm just putting the screen share back on because I had to share my sound. So hopefully this will work and you'll be able to hear it. No yesterdays to hold on to I can't tell you what happened again today I will find the right words to explain But I'm tired of taking all the blame And when I cannot sleep And have nothing left to give you Cause you are my song Black or white Means so much more To start a new day Or slam the door Sometimes the words that you say Can't be taken away But I'm here to show you I'm so much more And when I cannot sleep And have nothing left to give Your love means I can let my feelings show
soul. So that was Darren Day and You Are My Soul. And you can put it on Alexa. <laughs> I just wanted to leave you with that because our children are inspiring. They are amazing. And they can achieve wonderful things. So I'll pass over to Claire. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. And thanks for finishing on the song because it really is amazing, isn't it? I think it sums up how proud we are of all of our children. So I've got a couple of questions which have come in. So if you want to just drop them in while we're going through the first couple, that'll be great. And uh, one of the questions is for Anya and Caroline, because you're, you've got birth children as well. So what are the main differences in the parenting of a child with FASD compared to being um, a, a birth mother? Do you want me to go? Do you want to go first, Anya? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we were really surprised by this in that I think we went in quite naively, sort of almost tick boxing everything that the social workers were saying, but actually sort of thinking that we would parented before, how different could it be? Um, and we've had to totally relearn parenting and, and learn what actually works as opposed to what we think should work and certainly what our family and friends might think should work. So, and that's been hard. That's been really hard because um, I think we both are not from massively strict backgrounds, but certainly more old school sticker charts, time out, et cetera. Um, and we just learned fairly early on that they don't work. You know, I'd love them to work because that's my default setting, but you have to do what actually works as opposed to what you'd like it to be. Um, and so it's it's relearning and, and learning what therapeutic parenting actually is and learning what works for the child in front of you. So it's been a big learning curve and it's not always been easy. Thank you, Anya and Caroline. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to reiterate what Anya said, it's, it's so different um, to parenting your own children and then you've got this little person who comes along and suddenly it's, whoa, okay, well, this isn't going to work. Shall we try this? That's not going to work. Shall we try this? So you're always, always learning, um, you know, uh, but you you do you do get to, you do get to a point where you know things do work but it's like treat every day as a new day because what works one day might not work another day so completely different thank you thank you very much for that um terry i'm going to ask you a couple of questions now um so your child was three when you adopted them he yeah. was three and a half when he came to us, yes. Thank you. I was just hoping I had the information right. Thank you, Terry. So what, you already had the diagnosis of FASD, yeah. which is quite unusual to get so so young, although Barbara had something very similar. So what, what made your son's behaviour different from another three and a half year old when he first came home? Um... <sighs> oh, Craig, well, obviously I hadn't... You know, I saw my friends' children and the things that they did. I think um, our little boy, um, who's called Tommy, he, he was a lot more, um, what's the word? The way we describe it is whizzy, fizzy, unable to settle, just on the go all the time, you know, and just couldn't, like, he literally was like a spinning top all the time doing headstands and roly polies and we know now that's all about sensory integration but at the time we didn't know that and we were like this little ball of energy all the time and um, and we had to keep him on the move a lot and it was about basically like we didn't get the downtimes like there's no like obviously there was the relentless Mr Tumble um that was the only thing that's the only time you got downtime because anything else you, you couldn't turn your back, like you couldn't leave them at all. So I guess that's the difference that I think like I would hear my friends saying like they would be able to have their little ones sitting close by watching the telly while they were doing something, but they could get on with something else. I couldn't do that because he was too impulsive. And because he didn't really have that sense of danger, yeah. it really was like, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't stand an iron while he was watching the telly because she didn't know if he was going to turn around and pull the cable or, you know, because he just, he was just so quick 
and he just didn't understand. Um, so I think for me, that was probably the biggest thing that I heard my friends saying they could get little moments, little pockets to do things, whereas I just couldn't do anything. It literally was just eyes on him, with him all the time. And that, that was the biggest difference, I think. Thank you. And just making sure that he kept safe and everybody else safe. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing how fast they can spin. Very fast. And watching TV upside down is another great snack. It's the best way, right? It's the best way. Absolutely. Feet in the air, head down, watching TV. Totally. <laughs> My 19-year-old still does that. And I'm like, does your neck not hurt? It's like, no. So thank you very much. Uh, we've had a question come in about how you can prepare yourself for adopting a child with FASD. Now, obviously, I'm delighted that you're here and asking these questions. Um, which is brilliant. Does anyone want to take that question? Anya, do you want to take that one? Yeah, definitely, because I think so much of what we're learning and uh, what you've even just alluded to is that actually all of this is doable, not easy at all, but it is doable. But what I think it really, really requires is the most amazing support network. I genuinely think if we'd got that much more proactively in place right at the start, I think our early years would have been much easier. And again, I think we paid lip service to that. I really think we just sort of said to the social workers, oh yeah, we've got an amazing support structure. But actually, if I'd really, really not just called on people, but told them what help looked like, you know, what does help look like to me? I think that would have made a massive difference. So that would be the first thing. The second thing would have been to research it much more. So we basically, although we got the diagnosis quite early on, all we were told by the medical advisors and the medical team when we went for that second approval um, panel was that there was a likelihood of some of the effects of alcohol. And we didn't, we weren't told much more and I'm, I'm cross about that, but also we didn't investigate much more. And I think if we'd have really armed ourselves with much more information and then been much more proactive. So really like right from the start, being on the phone to, um, you know, FASD hub and to Adoption UK and just getting that, that structure around us, you know, that phrase about it takes a village. Well, with a child with FASD, you, you need several villages all around you holding you up. And yeah. then it's doable. It is doable, but you just have to have that support. And you have to be honest about the highs and the lows. There's There are some lows and, and you need people to carry you at that time. So those would be my two things. Get the information, but really get a support structure right in place and be proactive. Thank you. And that support structure can take many different forms. You know, the FASD hub run fantastic Facebook groups and meetings. So your support network doesn't necessarily have to be someone who lives at the bottom of your road. It can be someone who you can connect with online, who absolutely gets who's not going to judge you. That's the biggest thing, isn't it? Not being judged for the way that you parent. So thank you very much for that. We've got quite a few questions come in. So we're gonna go on to the next one if that's okay. Um, Barbara, I think this is probably for you if you know this one. What age is most common for diagnosis? So oh, easy answer to that one. <laughs> I don't think. Um, I would say that if the facial features are present, then there can be a diagnosis quite young. Um, generally, it's unlikely you get a diagnosis before the age of six. But for a lot of children, young people, the real signs and symptoms of FASD aren't really seen until about between the ages of eight and 12. Yeah. So it is vast. <laughs> there isn't an average age because everyone is different. Um, and it just depends on, on how the FASD presents, really, and on the parent's own knowledge of FASD and the knowledge of the local health team as well. So with, there is some research that suggests if the diagnosis is before the age of six, then the outcomes are much more positive. But unfortunately, it's, it's quite hard to get a diagnosis before the age of six. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'm delighted as an adoptive parent with a child with FASD, that in the last two, three years, there's been an explosion in the UK around FASD. I hold my hands up that when I adopted many years ago, it was never mentioned, I'd never heard of it. And it's only because I literally stumbled into the wrong training session, and that's that's actually how it happened. Sat so there thinking, this is my son. 
and otherwise yeah we might be in a very different place so it's, it's for me having people here and learning so they can be asking those questions and getting that support is key so thank you thanks for that answer um right another one really i think for you barbara uh, about the pathways where do you start with getting a diagnosis okay so if you are well if it, I'll start with the Scottish version. Um, so you, in Scotland, you would go along to your GP and you would ask for a referral to a paediatrician who has knowledge of neurodevelopmental conditions. And they would then pass you on to child and, adult, child and adolescent mental health and they would carry out an assessment. In England, it's the same kind of pathway. You would go along to a GP, but you also have the option of going straight to the FESD clinic, which is based in Surrey. It's run by Dr. Raja Mukherjee. And if you're very fortunate, if you don't live in the Surrey area, some health boards will pay for you to go there to get an assessment done. You can also, with your permission, your child's school or social work can also make a referral to CAMS as well for an assessment. So there's a few different routes, but generally you go to your GP, you take as much information about FASD that you can, because you may be educating them about FASD. You gather as much evidence about prenatal alcohol exposure that you can find. And as prospective adopters, that's something you can be doing just now when you're learning about children, you're talking to social workers, you can be asking about any evidence about prenatal alcohol exposure. Because if you don't have the facial features, then you have to have evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure. So getting that as early on, even if you don't have any concerns about the child, getting that evidence early on can make a huge difference later on. But yeah, go to your GP and health visitors can be really amazing as well for advice. Thank you. Um, when we got our diagnosis, I made an appointment, I made a triple appointment because I knew it was going to take a while with the GP, but didn't take my son because I wanted to be able to have open and honest conversations and the GP hadn't heard of FASD. So it was glad, good job I had that triple appointment. Um, and if I confess to actually sitting in the uh, CCG's office, refusing to move until they funded the assessment at the Surrey Centre. So yeah, you have to kind of be prepared to battle to get this. I think it's around just under £4,000 at the moment, isn't it, if you pay privately yeah. for the um, assessment. Um, someone's just asked here, what do you mean when you say get the evidence of prenatal exposure, which is a great question. Yeah, yeah. So it's all kind of, what, what they need is evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure and they kind of grade it, I think it's zero to four, depending on how strong that evidence is. Now, the strongest evidence you could have would be if the woman who gave birth to the child confirms that the pregnancy was alcohol exposed. So for birth families who are looking after a child with FESD, then that is hopefully fairly uh, straightforward. However, for adoptive families, it is really, can be really, really challenging to get that PAE evidence. So it can be found in things like social work reports. It can be found in medical records. You can request uh, like antenatal, yeah, there's some of it's redacted, but you can request some medical information. And it could be found in police reports. Maybe, maybe the biological mother has been found to be under the influence of alcohol while she was pregnant, so maybe made it into a report somewhere. So any of that counts as being prenatal alcohol evidence, or it could be from a reliable witness. So maybe a social worker or maybe another family member who can confirm that the, the pregnancy was alcohol exposed. Uh, any, we're going to be re releasing a fact sheet very soon about prenatal alcohol evidence, but anything you can find out, any information you can get before those records are all sealed and the adoption goes through, then I would strongly suggest you get it because you never know how useful it may be. And I think you have to be a bit of a detective, don't you? And sometimes read between the lines. So if in the child's permanence report, it's saying that the birth mum socialised during pregnancy um, in the local pub, but doesn't say about the alcohol it's going away it's asking those questions you know, did anyone see her is there any more information is there anything you can tell me and it is reading between those lines and yeah you're you're nodding to that so I think you've been in similar haven't you yeah well just that I think things have moved on quite a long way and I'm really grateful for that um I, I feel like there's much more awareness of how common this is and um that I think social workers are looking out for it more 
So I, I feel hopeful going forward that actually it will be picked up sooner rather than later. Unfortunately with us, it, it really wasn't, which looking back is so ironic seeing as three half siblings were all removed and had diagnoses. You know, for me, the assumption there should be actually there's a likelihood of rather than let's wait and see. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, I can't remember if it was you, Claire or Barbara said there's been such a lot of changes the last couple of years. And I do think that awareness, the nice guidance, um, there's some really big changes that make me feel much more positive that we'll get earlier diagnoses and, and that can only be a good thing. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and the person just asked, so do you need to get the evidence before matching when meeting? The more you can get before matching, the more prepared you are going in. Um, asking those questions because you can actually have access to everything before the adoption order. Once the adoption order goes through, it is really difficult to get information. So you, you, you'll have a meeting with a medical advisor, ask those questions, you'd have had you know, highlight things that don't quite add up or the odd sentence and take that along with you in the CPR and say, yeah, I've got these questions. Can you have a look on their record? Can you have a look in their red book? Can you see if there's anything else anywhere that's added in? Because that will make a huge difference and make it much easier. It was really hard for us because we were four years post adoption order and trying to get the information was like pulling teeth. So thank you. Thank you very much. Right, we've got another question. Um, on our matching criteria for adoption, we have cons put considered uh, for FASD. What are the top questions we should be asking? Should we get matched with a child with FASD? So Caroline, do you want to take, what question would you ask? I'm putting you on the spot, aren't I? Everyone else has a chance to have a think now. What questions should you ask? I would just, ask about the child you know learn about the child learn about you know their strengths their positives you know you, you there, are, there are going to be difficulties there you know you could ask about their difficulties learn about their difficulties um there's there's no there's no easy way there's no there's no easy way of you know, it's, ask, yeah. ask questions like, yeah, what helps them to soothe? How can you, how, how do you help regulate? Oh, regulate, regulate. Yeah. Music, she loves music, you know, and um, you could help. She puts her earphones in after school, she comes into the car, sticks her earphones in, and I just leave her. I leave her for a good hour, you know. Um, she likes her bath, you know, she would she spent hours in the bath if, if you would let her, you know. Um, to calm her, it, sometimes it takes hours to calm her down. You know, it de it depends what kind of day she's had in school. Um, as long as I keep it in routine, routine's a great thing to have. No matter in the summer holidays, we stick to the routine because if the routine the routine is upset, then somebody gets a little bit upset. So yeah. No, thank you. Terry, can you remember what questions you asked because your child had a diagnosis of um, FAP? Yeah, I mean, for us, I think one of the things, like if you've got considered written on your form that you'd consider a child with FASD, it's worth remembering that you kind of know what, like if that child's got the diagnosis, like our little boy had, we knew that he had that because I think if children come and they don't, if you, you're looking at children without diagnosis, you don't know what's going to develop over time and like being part you know being party to a lot of the people in the FASD hub who have then found out after the fact that their children have FASD it's much harder for them so I would say that actually if you've got considering FASD and you know the child has it and the child already has a diagnosis you're already a step ahead so actually that makes it easier because then just like Caroline said you ask about the child what is the child like? Because it's all very well reading the little blurb about them and you do literally just get a little blurb. It's like, you know, it, it's the only way the process works, but it's like a catalogue or, you know, or a newspaper that's got these little, and that tells you nothing about who that person is. So really it's about finding out who the person is, but finding out what else goes alongside it. And for us, it was the meeting with a medical examiner that was really the, the key to it because she had all of it in front of her. And 
I suppose I had the luck that, like, so I was a psychiatric nurse. Right. Um, yeah. So I already had a really good, lengthy career as a psychiatric nurse behind me. So I knew what to look for. I knew what to ask for. And one of the things I would say is that if there's drug use, if there's illicit substance misuse in there, there has probably been alcohol misuse because people... People will use alcohol, but not use illicit substances. But most people who use illicit substances will have used alcohol. So if it's in there that the child's been born with the neonatal abstinence syndrome stuff, ask about alcohol, ask if there's anything in there. But just ask about the other health things, because obviously there are so many other things with FASD and you'll see them, you know, in the heart, in the fact sheets that it's worth just seeing well what what is their health like what's their physical health like do they have mobility problems you know anything like that yeah I guess it's just asking about that little person but also remembering that there's a great little person underneath it all and it doesn't really yeah. that diagnosis means nothing about how great that little person is absolutely and yeah do you have a question that you wish that you'd have asked I think I just would have liked to know more of what living day to day with someone with FASD would be like. I think, I, you know, evenings like tonight and, um, you know, speaking to people with lived experience, I think that would have been really helpful. I think some strategies, you know, things like, you know, when there's a really big meltdown, what, what could work? And like you were saying, Terry, you know, it, each person is an individual so there's no point trying to come up with a one size fits all but you know what are some of the strategies really what does therapeutic parenting look like in reality um so just sort of bringing it all to life but but you're so right that uh, you know I remember looking at the form for my son and I remember looking at the picture and you know it, it's a it's a snapshot and it's fairly helpful but you don't know that person until they're actually living with you and it's a it's a whole person and we all have strengths and weaknesses you know people with FASD people not with FASD um so if all you're looking at is a list of someone's weaknesses you know no one would ever adopt me um because if they just saw a big pile of my weaknesses you know grumpy in the morning and yeah a bit of a pain in the bum it, at certain times of the month all those kind of things no one would ever want to be my friend or adopt me or whatever so we, we've got to move away from just a list of negatives about FASD, which is why I think the whole tone of tonight and the song and all of that is so important. You know, it's there's highs and lows as with everything in life. No, thank you. And what we're going to do is, and just so that the panelists know, we're going to end on one positive from your child. So you can start thinking, because I think that's a really nice way to end. So you can be thinking, because there'll be hundreds of things you can say, but we're going to narrow it down to one. So no pressure. So you've got a few minutes to think about that. Um, I had a question that's come in about um, when you get most of the information and you should have all the information before you go to matching panel. You shouldn't go to matching panel until you are 100 percent confident that you have the information you need, that you've met with the foster carers, you've met with the medical advisors, you've had your questions, you've gone through everything with a really fine tooth comb. Your social worker has looked at it with their head because we look at everything with our hearts, don't we? And that's what gets us through. And actually, I think sometimes you need your social worker to go, let's just ask about this or this doesn't is ringing some bells somewhere so you should never go to matching panel until you are 100 percent confident that you have all the answers that comes up there um the other question i've got is how much knowledge and acceptance of fasd are social adoption workers looking for as we go through the process which is a great question because in my experience every social worker is different even those that work for the same agency come at everything with very different viewpoints. For me, and I think for everybody here, the more information you can gain, the better prepared you are. Because I didn't know that my child had FASD and you know, it was four and a half years in before we got a diagnosis of FASD. And I know now if we'd have done some of the strategies before we had the diagnosis, it would have really helped. And because there's so many crossovers with social and communication disorder, with trauma, with attachment, that they're, they're all skills that you need, isn't it? Does anyone want to add to that? Barbara, do you want to add in? 
I would just say that I think things are improving, but doing your homework and learning about FESD, you may find that you know more about FESD than the social workers. We're still at that kind of tipping point at the moment. So um, you can all take a role in educating social workers as well, uh, because I mean, it is just such a, a vast topic and show your willingness to, to learn and research and that's going to set you in really good stead. Yeah. OK, I'm going to go to the last question because I'm just conscious of time. I want to make sure we, we all get time to really celebrate and show off our children and be how, how proud we are of them. So does FASD affect our adulthood? Who wants to take that one? Barbara, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can take that one. Yes, it does. Um, FASD is a lifelong condition and it does look different as you go through the years. You... You might find that you are you have a, a 45 year old child who is acting 25, or you might have a 25 year old who's acting 12. The, like, the biggest thing you're likely to notice is that age difference, the spiky profile. Um, but as I was saying earlier on, FESD is really, really prevalent. One in 20 people have FESD. So there are a lot of people out there who are doing really well and really functioning and have no idea that they have FESD. They maybe just have little quirks yeah. Um, so it is lifelong and it can be difficult getting support as an adult with FESD but change is coming I'm positive of that thank you very much um, and I know I said that was going to be the last question but I just got the last question here can you get the support you need once you get the diagnosis or do you get support for the smaller break-off diagnosis such as autism ADHD sensory processing it's really a mix isn't it I think yeah there's there's times and places where support from a uh, Facebook group on FA um, um, autism can be really beneficial and can really help you and there's other times where you know coming to a meeting this, we all had a pre-meeting before we did this webinar and we're all going yep yeah, my child does that yep yeah. And we're all kind of nodding and there's something really reassuring knowing that you're in with a group of people who absolutely understand and we can laugh. Um, so, sorry, more about professional support. It's a bit of a postcode lottery, isn't it? Terry, do you want to say about the support that you've recently got and Caroline, maybe about the support that you're trying to get? Would that be OK? Um, yeah, so basically, um, because our little guy came to us with the diagnosis, we had some support in place. But then obviously, as children go through developmental stages, things fall away and they don't need them so when he came to us he had speech and language therapy because of sensory stuff with his mouth but as he got older he didn't need that um, and then for a long time we didn't really have any other support and then we um, sourced play therapy because we couldn't really get any joy with cams um, in our area um, so we had sourced a play therapist and so he's been going to that but recently um, in uh, discussions with social work we've been um they've been absolutely fantastic because our little boy's going through puberty and that does bring more challenges with impulsivity and poorer emotional regulation and um, that basically we needed a bit more support and social work have um sourced us respite so it's not overnight it's not weekends because we don't have family support who can help us with childcare. But it's basically a bit like befriending. So they're going to be picking him up from school a couple of afternoons, keeping him for an hour or so. And then every so often on a weekend, we're going to have um, two or three hours um, just to give us a bit of a break. And they've also sourced another family. Um, so there can be like play dates and stuff just to give us that bit of gap as well. So the support is definitely there. Um, if you if you chase it and you know it is the, the, is the reality you do have to chase it you are kind of you know you do have to sort of plead your case but the more evidence you have and the more you're kind of putting yourself out there and working with them the more likely you are to get it so we've been really lucky um but we also our social workers have recognized the difficulties that our child has and what he needs for that so that's what we've been able to get so it Thank is you. there Thank you, Terry. And Caroline, you're in a slightly different position, aren't you? Yes, um, just slightly. <laughs> we have struggled to get support. Um, we had issues with the GP. Um, we'd went for an autism assessment, but she didn't quite meet the criteria. 
So then it was back to square one, you know, you know, you just know there's something. So you're back and forth and back and forth. And um, the school nurse was involved with Faith, my daughter, because she was having trouble trouble with her emotions in school. So the school nurse was involved. The school nurse had suggested FASD. I'd never heard of it. So I contacted the FASD hub. That was a lifesaver. Um, the support that they have offered has been has been brilliant and it's great to talk to people who you know just get it so at the minute um we have seen the ot who has put things in place in school which is fantastic cams have not been very helpful at all unfortunately and just last week, our GP had to phone the school to get the school psychologist to help with our our yeah. daughter because I wasn't getting really anywhere with her. So we we're at that stage where I'm I'm still fighting, mm -hmm. you know, to get to get the support. We don't have any social work involvement, um. So I think that's where you know probably where our difficulties lie. Yeah. So. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think for all of us, it's it's a challenge and it's hard work, but when the right support is in place, it makes such a difference. So I'm conscious it's now nine o'clock. I think we've got through most of the questions. So apologies if we didn't get to everyone's question. And I think we it's, it, yeah, it's perfect to finish on a real positive note from each of you. So Barbara, can I start with you? Yeah, my son is hilarious. He's, he's just absolutely hilarious everything he does everything he says just makes us laugh so so much and he's just a little bundle of hilarious joy perfect thank you thanks Barbara Terry hello um yes I, I, I would say yes my little boy is very very funny he loves a pun loves a good pun and uh, a bit of word play and things like that um he's an amazing singer he's in the national youth choir for scotland and um he's one of these annoying children who's good at everything he tries everything <laughs> he tries he's absolutely excellent whether it's football whether it's painting whether it's poetry whether it's you know whatever he's he's yeah. really good at it so um yeah it's very Thank annoying, you. but he is so cute, you can't help love him. Thank you, Terry. Caroline? Our girl loves art. She has has a thing for eyes at the moment. She draws the most beautiful eyes. It kind of blows me away. Um, and our music, we're listening to opera music just now, which is fine. It's great. It's different. But, you know, um, and she's so empathetic, loves every animal under the sun you know loves people and it's just so so kind thank you and yeah um that he chucks himself at life at a hundred percent tries everything gives everything a go um is into everything and is just teaches me daily about going for it in life um and i love that i love that spirit Thank you. And my proud mum moment is my son passed his driving test for the first time, the first time he took it a month ago. Yeah. And he's out driving in a car. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Whole new level of worry, but hey, <laughs> he's doing well. Yeah. So thank you very much for that. And hopefully, thank you so much to the panel for talking so openly and honestly and for being here this evening. I really wish that I'd have had sessions like this when I was a prospective adopter, would have gone in much more with my eyes open. And I really do appreciate you being so open. So thank you very much. Um, Barbara's put in the chat a download, a flat fact sheet if you want to download that, that's in the chat. I'd like to thank everyone who's come along this evening for being so brilliant and for asking such fantastic questions. It always keeps us on our toes. Um, every time I do an evening like this, I always learn and take away something. So thank you very much. And for me, I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you here learning about FASD before you adopt. So thank you. I've just had a comment come in. Thank you everyone, really informative. Lovely, thank you very much. So the panellists are okay just to hold on and we shall say goodnight to everybody else. Um, another one here. Thank you so much, ladies. This has been brilliant. Really loved hearing all the strengths and positives. Thank you. Thank you very much. We could do 
a week's worth of webinars on how fantastic our children are, couldn't we? Yeah. So thank you. So thank you very much. So we shall say good night to everyone and let you get back. Uh, Barbara's presentation was very thorough and informative. Fantastic. Very good, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great point. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, another one here. Thank you. This has been great. So thank you for your feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> and clapping hands. Lovely. Thank you. So yeah, so you can now go back and take everything in that's been said, but thank you very much for joining us. So we're just gonna say good night to everybody.